Right. Thank you very much all for uh, showing up. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Rutger Voss. Uh, I've been very lucky to be here for a month now at DBCLS. And it was a very good time. Actually, I'm leaving the day after tomorrow. Uh, I work at the uh, University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Uh, Reading is a city just west of London. Uh, I'm a biologist. My background is in evolution and phylogenetics. Um, my work now is as a uh, Marie Curie Fellow, so that's a European program where young researchers can spend two years working on something that interests them. Um, and I'm always, uh, I've always been interested in the evolution of primates and sort of our place in the evolution of primates. Um, Previously, I looked at their phylogeny and their systematics. And um, what I've been working on now is trying to compare their genomes and understand how, how to make a monkey, I guess. So how to uh, go from, um, let's see, which areas of the genome have been under selection to give rise to any one species of monkey for which we have the data. So hence the title of my talk. Um, so the perspective I'm going to give you is just from a researcher, a biologist. I've tried to make it more interesting for you guys. So there's a lot more of the technical challenges that I've had to deal with just trying to do my own research. But there's going to be a lot of biology in this talk as well. And, um, I guess we'll try to sort of interface and see which parts we understand from each other's work. So my talk is going to be pretty much a standard research talk. So I'll introduce my question, my research question. I'll give you some background about the data that we have right now on primates. Um, then I'll give you a little bit of background about the problem of finding homology between these genomes. So to find sort of shared characteristics, shared loci. Um, and then how do we actually find whether those loci have been subject to natural selection, sort of the standard approaches that we use for that. And assuming that we can identify loci that have been under selection, then can we characterize what the function is of those loci? So having outlined all that, I'll go a little bit more deeply into the um, methods in terms of just the hacking that I've had to do to make it all work. Um, although I am a biologist, I've learned to program a little bit. And um, it turns out that I've clearly had to do a lot of work myself to make this all work. I mean, there's obviously a lot of development work going on and good toolkits. but Nonetheless, if you want to do this kind of work as a biologist, you'll need to know a little bit of scripting and a little bit of hacking to actually make it all come together. So I'll tell you about the machine that I've been working on. We've got a pretty nice cluster and sort of the, the general workflow in terms of the analysis steps and then how I implemented that as a workflow design. Um, it's all pretty simple. But maybe that's also useful to know how a biologist actually deals with this. Um, I have some results, but the research is still very much ongoing. So I'll give you some preliminary findings. And it's all going to be very speculative. Um, so I hope there's not that many biologists in the room, because they'll see how I'm fudging <laughs> things. Um, I'll try to draw some conclusions, so some biological conclusions, I guess some conclusions about how this kind of stuff works in practice when someone like me tries to get work done. And then I'll sort of end in the usual fashion. So the basic question is this. Assuming we have, you know, somewhere ages ago, primates started evolving and splitting into new species. And over time, they started to occupy a very large sort of multi-dimensional space in terms of their morphology, behavior, life history, you know, uh, ecology, diets, mating systems. Um, 
So every biologist, if they study some group, they always say that the group they're working on is the most exciting one. And I'm going to say the same thing. Um, to me, of course, primates are interesting because we're primates. So to st if we study them, we can understand more about where we come from. But that aside, primates show a lot of variation, actually, in, of course, in size. I mean, there's primates this big and there's gorillas. Uh, there's primates that live at night and are active at night or during the day. There's a lot of different mating systems and social systems. And actually, there's primates that just eat insects, so there's plants, fruits. Um, a lot of variation. Um, so over time, uh, these primates must have evolved to fill all these different spaces. And probably there's some genetic basis to that, right? Now, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, it would have seemed very obvious that, of course, this is genes that have evolved and so we can see the evidence in these genes, we can see adaptation, we can identify the functions of those genes, and so then you know how this monkey came about. Now that we understand the genome better, of course, the story is much more complicated. We know that there's all sorts of other sequences that also determine you know, when genes are expressed and where, and so the simple paradigm that it's all just evolution in genes doesn't really hold anymore. Nonetheless, at least in genes we can show natural selection and the effect of natural selection and that's why I look at genes and not something else. So it's not that I take sides in this debate that's actually ongoing. This is just something that's practical to do. So that's why I'm doing it. So I look at gene function, I look at evidence of selection, uh, of course, uh, as much of primate evolutionary history as we have available now, which isn't that much, but it's growing rapidly. So we actually now have nine primate genomes. Um, so in the top left, this is Craig Venter, right, the first human genome. Um, actually, recently, now the Neanderthal genome has become uh, available, but it's not as well annotated yet, and you know, I haven't uh, had time to use it. But the other species that we do have are chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. So, including us, those are the great apes. Um, then we have the rhesus monkey genome. So, rhesus monkeys are old world monkeys. So, in uh, you know, uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. We have the common marmoset, which is a New World monkey, so in South America. We have the Philippine tarsier, so those are these tiny little ones. Uh, we have the uh, galago and the uh, mouse lemur, which together are part of a group called the strepsorines, previously called prosimians, but that's not really a term we use anymore. So galagos are in Africa, and the lemurs are all in Madagascar, as you probably know. So here I'm showing you where in the entire group of primates these genomes fit. This is a figure that I produced uh, in uh, grad school. So um, I mentioned briefly before that previously I was interested in their phylogeny. So this is a phylogenetic tree. Um, you're probably familiar a little bit with, with how these things work. So this is a tree for all the primates. Um, in this tree are 218 species. There's actually a couple more, but let's say there might be 250 species. Uh, for those species, I collected smaller previously published trees based on a variety of data, so molecular data, morphological data. Um, and I combined all these using a super tree method that maybe the computer scientists among you might be a little bit familiar with. Um, so you combine those all in a matrix that sort of in binary form represents the shapes of these, all these smaller trees. 
then you analyze that matrix to infer a new tree and you end up with this shape which actually worked out fairly nicely so almost all the genera so the genus is one level up from species right almost all the genera actually work out as monophyletic groups so they all have uh, the same ancestor to the exclusion of all others so this is sort of an indication that the tree is relatively compelling then for the species in that tree I collected uh, DNA sequences just from GenBank a whole bunch of different loci and I aligned those and I used those data to then infer how deep these nodes are so the length of these branches is proportional to time uh, proportional to uh, evolutionary change in the DNA which I calibrated on fossil data on a bunch of different nodes and eventually anchored on this root so the root of the primate tree is sort of by convention placed at the KT boundary so this event where a great big rock fell from the sky 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs the idea being that once the dinosaurs were gone there was a lot of space for mammals to evolve including primates now I, I contributed the data that I had collected for this super tree to a, a larger consortium for the mammal super tree which came out in nature I think two years ago and in that paper we actually reanalyzed the data including these dates and these deeper branch lengths and the conclusion with that we draw there is that this easy story of the big rock falling from the sky and then making space for all these mammals isn't quite true uh, it looks like a lot of the major mammal groups were already around during the dinosaurs and actually there wasn't so much an explosion in new species just at this boundary but the, the age of this group is, is roughly here, maybe a little bit deeper. Now in blue I'm showing you the genomes that we have now. So out of 218 species we don't have that much yet, but at least it is nicely spread out over the tree. Right? So this group here are the strepsorines. Uh, I guess some people might say they're the most primitive primates. Now, evolutionary biologists don't like to use words like primitive and modern because we're all the same age. But these are the ones that are, for example, Madagascar, right, these cute little things. This tiny group are the tarsiers. Then all of these are in South America, including this marmoset for example. Now you can see there's more density here in the great apes because we have all of them. Uh, this group next to it are the uh, gibbons, so I guess the lesser apes. And then this large group here are the old world monkeys including here the rhesus monkey genome. So that's the data that we have. And in that data I then need to find out which of those genes actually are shared between these species and um, perhaps some of you are familiar with this problem but I'll, I'll just go over it uh, real quickly so assuming here we have another tree a species tree so at the tip we have species A, B, C and D and in these lineages are genes sort of traveling through time to the present and once in a while a gene duplicates so for example here there's been a gene sort of traveling through the common ancestor and it duplicated so now we have two copies and these copies start tracking the history of these species so then this is actually a speciation event where these copies now start following these species and then once in a while what can also happen is that a gene is lost so for example here a gene is lost so now we end up with the situation where species A and B just have one copy species C and D have two copies and now we need to sort out which is which right which is orthologous and which is paralogous and the standard approach and the one that I've taken so far is to use blasting in two directions right so you might uh, blast uh, gene A, like 
gene 1 in species A against the genome for B, and you might get B1 back, and then you try it in the other direction, and it turns out that with each other, they're the best hit that is returned from the blasting. So then we conclude that probably they are each other's orthologs. Um, and sometimes this works out nicely. Now, if you have these losses and these duplications, you might get some uh, kind of symmetry. So, for example, if you use C2, so this copy that originated from this duplication as the query sequence, then uh, you blast that against species A's genome, it might return A1, but conversely, if you use A1 as the target sequence, it'll return C1. So you get this asymmetry where there's some kind of uncertainty. So in my own research, I'll just ignore those for the time being. And hopefully, if I still have time, um, I'll use a more tree-based method that can actually sort out in greater detail which is which. But for now, I've just skipped over those because I wanted to see what, what came out in the end. Right? So assuming with that approach, we get uh, a large amount of uh, orthologs and they align nicely, we can now look if there's some sort of signature of natural selection. Um, and the uh, thinking behind this is that, well, there is redundancy in the genetic code, right? Because each codon, there's 64 possible combinations, right? Four times four times four but there's only 20 amino acids. So many codons code for the same amino acid, and this is sort of shown here. So for example, with the first position being U and the second being C, and actually on the third position, it doesn't matter what's there. You're always going to get serine. Um, so this is what's then called a fourfold degenerate site. Now, if there's a mutation or a substitution on the fourth position, this is called a synonymous substitution, and it doesn't actually alter the resulting product, right? So it has no effect in terms of the phenotype of the organism. Now, in other third positions, some substitutions actually do change the resulting product. So that's a non-synonymous substitution. And we assume that when that happens, it is because actually the other gene product now has become more adaptive because of some changing, you know, adaptive landscape, selective pressure. And so we try to draw some conclu conclusion about the ratio between the synonymous and the non-synonymous substitutions. I've always learned that we call this DNDS ratio, but you'll see other terms for this as well, right, such as KAKS or omega, they all basically describe the same concept. We look at the ratio of non-synonymous over synonymous substitutions. And depending on what the ratio is, we might draw different conclusions. So if there's many non-synonymous substitutions, we assume that that's because there's been positive selection in a direction that favors change in the resulting gene product. Now, if the ratio is roughly one, you might say, well, that is neutral evolution, but of course, there can just be opposing forces at work as well. There could be stabilizing selection, and there could also be uh, directional selection, and they might cancel each other out. Um, if the ratio is smaller than one, we might conclude that the gene product just needs to stay the way it was. So we call that stabilizing selection or perhaps purifying selection. So I'm interested in this first one, right? So some sort of direction to a new optimum. Okay, assuming we have our orthologs, we've identified ones that show evidence of selection, then what do those genes actually do? Well, here um, we now have a very nice artifact, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, the gene ontology. Um, obviously, this is still very much a work in progress. Um, 
and if you look very closely there might be some things that aren't so nice but all in all it's the best we have so the gene ontology for those of you unfamiliar with it is basically a hierarchical database of terms with which genes are annotated and so it's a directed acyclic graph or like a tree structure and at the top level are three main domains biological process, cellular component and molecular function and below that there's this deeper and deeper hierarchy of more and more specific terms with which we annotate genes. So here's an example the gene ontology, the root node itself has a Go identifier, so this is what these always look like, Go and then a number, so the root has the number 003673. Below that there's these three domains, and below that there's deeper and deeper nodes. Now, uh, nodes can occur in multiple locations, genes can be annotated to multiple locations, so it's sort of a kind of a complicated network in, in, at the end in practice, but this is sort of what it looks like. Okay, so having introduced to you these uh, concepts, the basic workflow that I've been going through is first of all I do a protein blast, so I take the, just the amino acid sequences for these nine genomes and I blast all versus all so then I get these reports for each uh, amino acid sequence against all these genomes. And then going by the logic I showed you earlier on the slide where you had the tree pointing down, I look at which target sequence results which hit in every other species and then I look if those results also return the best hit back in the genome in which the target sequence originated. So I call that a reciprocal best hit for the remainder of my talk. Then I try to cluster those um, around the human genome. So I look at, okay, what is the best hit in any of those other uh, genomes? And then I align those clusters. Uh, so protein alignment, then I back translate that to DNA so that I get nice codon alignments which I can then use to do these D and the N ratio tests actually on all the branches, so not just sort of pairwise but on a small tree of these uh, genomes. And then for the ones that show interesting results I look up the Go terms for those sequences and I try to make some sort of biological sense out of this. So conceptually this is what I'm trying to do. Now returning to the theme of today, um, of course I've also had to worry a lot about how long this is all going to take, uh, the amount of data, how can I make this run more efficiently. So there are some sort of very simple design principles that I followed through trial and error, but this is where I ended up with. So obviously you're going to need a single BLAST database of all these genomes, so that's the one step that basically you need to do all at once. Beyond that, it's pretty trivial to actually parallelize the rest. So the way I did it is I just split it into the nine genomes and then from there split each of those genomes in their constituent genes. So then you get for each genome roughly 20,000 genes there's quite a bit of variation, but on average, this is sort of what it works out to in primates. And then I can just process each of those files in, seri in series or parallel or however you want to do it um, uh, on the cluster that we have in Reading. So this is sort of the basic design principle. In practice, this is kind of how it works out. So we have a uh, job scheduling system called Torque, where you can write a little shell script and invoke it with QSub, and then it gets at some point when the job scheduler decides it's time to run your job, it'll deploy that on some node. So I have my nine species, so I have nine little command scripts, and they're each deployed on the node. And in those scripts, all I'm doing is set some environment variables to identify which species we're looking at and where each 
uh, data are located. So we set the environment. Then I've actually, this is all very old school, so I've actually just used GNU make files. Um, so the GNU make has this nice facility where you can run things in parallel on cores, on multiple cores. So for each of these, then I run it on four cores because you know, each of our compute nodes has four cores. So in, in the end, for each step in the analysis, I end up using 36 cores, right? Nine species, four cores. So it's you know, not massively parallel, but it turned out that this worked well enough. So each step, so for example, the blasting, then ends up taking maybe two to three days, and then the next step, that same amount. So it's, it's, you know, this was manageable enough. I guess maybe I could have done it even more parallel, but this was easy conceptually to just split it in species and then in genes. So that's what I did. So the software that I used, uh, well, so I did this for a bunch of different steps, right? And each of those steps, eventually the make files then have commands to invoke you know, software that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So for example, I use these NCBI standalone BLAST tools. So first format DB to make my BLAST database, then BLAST P to do the protein blasting, um, and then to fetch the cDNA sequences that are um, associated with the amino acid sequences. I use FASTA commands, so it's just a database lookup to get these sequences back. For the alignment, I've used muscle. Um, then to align the cDNAs against the amino acids, I use gene-wise, so that sort of splices out any weird parts. Uh, then to do the uh, DNDS calculations, I use HiFi. Um, and then it's all glued together with Perl because sort of, you know, for historical reasons, I've become kind of a Perl hacker. I don't know if that's okay to admit here in the Ruby land, but... Um, this is how that came about. So I use BioPerl. I also use BioPhilo, which is a project I started uh, a few years ago. Um, I actually heard while I was here that the application note describing it is now accepted, so it's coming out soon. I just use it to you know, do some file parsing, pretty basic stuff. Um, now I need to also do a little bit of tree manipulation because I need to snip, like sort of prune trees down to the size of the alignments that I end up with. And BioPerl isn't that good for it, so that's one of the reasons why I've been using this BioPhilo. Um, I learned through trial and error that it's probably best for, with any of these other applications, to wrap them inside a Perl script so I can trap any errors that occur because they all have their own weird API with return values and you know you have to kind of figure out what might have gone wrong. Um, and BioPhilo has this logging system that shows you know where and when things happened. So it's kind of nice if you write these wrappers that you get the same sort of log you know, format it in the same way, so you can always figure out in the same way what went wrong, just sort of grab through the log and see what happened. I try to follow best practices in this, so it's all under SVN, it's all, uh, you know, it can all be recovered if uh, disasters happen. And I um, organized it all in a pretty standard way. I don't know if you guys ever have to worry about this kind of stuff, but of course, more and more we're working in teams with a bunch of biologists. And every biologist sometime in grad school comes up with their own ridiculous way of organizing files. And if you try to work together, then it's very hard to reconstruct what's what because it's all, you know, latest version, you know, even later version, all these weird file names. So I've started, I adopted this system that was described in a paper that came out two years ago. This is a very standard uh, file structure, but if you're working with a bunch of people, it's very useful to just point them to this paper and just say, look, this is just what we're going to do. So just standard conventions of how things are done around here. So that's what I did. This is the, uh, the toy I've been allowed to play with. Um, so this has been supplied to us by IBM, 
And IBM always has a habit of putting blue somewhere in the title. So this is Thames Blue because Reading is near the River Thames, which also runs through London, as I'm sure you know. Um, on the website, it says it's one of the 100 fastest supercomputers in the world. That, that was a few years ago, so it's probably not, no longer true. Um, it runs SASE Linux. I guess maybe sort of uh, going back to your introductory talk, so it runs uh, IBM's general parallel file system, which in this case is kind of useful because I have a ton of different files that ideally can be accessed at the same time. And so the batch management is done with Torque and it just sort of does magic in the background. I've never had to worry about any of this stuff. So it's, it's pretty good hardware. Um, I haven't had to use that many nodes actually on it, but it was nice to have it available. Most of the stuff is actually used by the meteorology department, of course, in England. The weather is always a big concern, so there's lots of people doing calculations on that. Okay, so some preliminary results. Now, the human genome has, uh, I guess, about 20,000 genes. Uh, we could debate that, but it, it turns out that using that as a reference and doing this reciprocal blasting, I actually uh, come up with nearly 6,000 loci that are shared between at least three species. So using the humans, there's two other species that return the reciprocal be best hit, which means I can then align those and have a little tree with at least three tips to do the DNDS calculations. For the most part, it's more than three, but this is sort of the minimum that I use to filter out any other singletons. Out of those, nearly half actually show some amount of DNDS ratio deviation somewhere on this tree. So this is a little tree that shows these nine species, how they are related. The end goal is that I'm going to be able to say for each branch, including these deeper ones, well, here there's been selection on these functions and here on these functions. So eventually we should end up with some sort of map that shows from here to here what's all been under selection to make this monkey or to make that monkey. So looking at the uh, Go terms that are then uh, returned, there's a lot of stuff that's very hard to interpret and there's a lot of stuff that I'll probably, probably need to filter out based on the evidence codes, so based on you know, how, how much I'm going to believe this stuff actually. But some things to a biologist are pretty exciting because they make some amount of sense. So for example, looking at the apes, so basically, looking at sort of this part of the tree, all over this, uh, you're going to see things that have to do with brain development, for brain development, uh, also to do with lifespan. So apes live much longer than other monkeys. And perhaps related to that, maybe also uh, terms to do with apoptosis, so cell death, which may, may have to you know, change as, as the organism lives longer. Uh, and even things to do with learning and with social behavior, which all sort of makes, makes a lot of sense, right? We live very long and there's a very long period where we have to learn a lot of stuff. And there's some uh, evidence for that in the genome, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, another thing that's actually um, sort of starting here, so in what you might call the higher monkeys, um, there's a lot of terms also that have to do with uh, eye development. So the more primitive monkeys have the eyes on the side and they have a visual system that uh, doesn't see color as well. But we do, and the other monkeys do as well. And you can see that actually uh, in the results. Uh, other things to do with pregnancy. Um, 
and with I guess here I'm interpreting, but here this you know things to do with spermatogenesis and with testosterone response. And then there's a lot of other stuff that I just can't really interpret. So this, this is all very preliminary. But this, I found this, from a biological perspective, pretty interesting. So of course, uh, if you're interested in where humans come from and how we stand apart from other monkeys and other animals, the main thing, of course, is our brain size, right? So. If we correct brain mass for body mass, you can see that we are really all the way on the end of the scale and then the other apes are there as well. So perhaps it's not surprising that we might see some signature in the genomes for that. Now likewise, um, uh, Primates, uh, monkeys and apes are uh, not just unique in um, brain size, but also actually in our color vision. So you know, our vision isn't particularly sharp compared to you know, eagles or something, but we do see uh, a lot of color, right? So unique among all the mammals, we can see, we have trichromatic vision. So we can basically see, um, blue, yellow, and red in, in all sorts of combinations. Now, there's also, there's actually a lot of variation within the primates. So there's also primates that are dichromatic. So sort of, you know, kind of, they would see kind of like this. And even within species, you see these weird systems. So because it is uh, linked to the X chromosome. So in New World monkeys, in many species, the females are trichromatic and the males are dichromatic. Um, there's also other kinds of variation, for example, color blindness also in, in, in us, that happens quite a bit. Um, and not necessarily just as, as there's being something you know, wrong with you if you're uh, color blind. Uh, there's some good arguments that it's actually uh, adaptive. The idea being that um, if you're colorblind like this, you are actually better at discerning sort of tan colors, sort of brownish, khaki, um, which was actually very useful in the savanna, you know, six million years ago. So there's some debate that maybe it's actually still maintained in the population because it used to be adaptive at the time. Okay, so very, 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 very preliminary. Uh, I think it's, it might not be surprising if I end up discovering that we see selection in those gene functions where there are actually multiple optima in the primates. So for example, the uh, functions that have to do with uh, pregnancy might be understood because in primates there's actually a lot of variation in the uh, placentation so and how the placenta forms. So you might think that, well, uh, it is a very harmonious thing where the mother nurtures the fetus and they're very happy together, but actually it is also in some way an arms race where the fetus wants to get more resources but the mother can't necessarily spare them. So you can see rapid change where some placentas are much more invasive than others. And of course, that's the result of uh, natural selection, which we might see in the genome. Uh, likewise, with these male competition things, so there's actually in primates a lot of variation in mating systems, even in the great apes. All the great apes have a different mating system, some you know, very promiscuous, others very monogamous. Um, and this places different uh, stresses on, um, uh, including on males and uh, on how much they invest in um, spermatogenesis, if you like. Um, there's different visual systems, different life histories, so how long you live and when you become active in different ways. Uh, different optima in investment in brains. I mean, it's nice to have big brains, but it's also very costly. Um, so perhaps 
uh, I'll end up discovering that those sort of different optima, different trade-offs uh, have influenced the results I'm seeing. But this is all very, 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 very preliminary. Now, from the perspective of today's uh, scope, uh, I guess uh, in terms of the methods, um, here's kind of the conclusions that I've come up with, you know, for your perspective. First of all, actually, uh, nine genomes as just FASTA files is really not that much. Um, I mean, maybe a few years ago it might seem like it's a fair amount to, to work on, but um, just yesterday I backed it up, and if I all, all zip it, it's 14 gigs. Well, that's not that much, obviously. Um, in the course of designing this whole workflow, I came across a bunch of situations where there were actually MPI versions of software that I might use. For example, there's an MPI version of BLAST, there's an MPI version of HiFi. And I tried to compile them and it was a, a huge pain and um, it was hard to see exactly what the benefit would be. Um, I mean, it's hard to predict how much faster an MPI version is going to be, right? It depends on how much communication there is between nodes. And so uh, I concluded that actually it made more sense to spend my time trying to just parallelize as much as possible and gain speed in that way. So actually I didn't use the MPI at all. Um, I try to keep everything very simple and consistent so every step works the same way with the same sort of make files and shell scripts, the same kind of logic. logic. And the way it's all organized is just sort of following conventions and I guess, you know, for computer scientists this might all be very obvious, but for a biologist you've got kind of other things to worry about. And so it takes a while to discover that it's a good idea to be sort of consistent with this kind of stuff. Uh, another thing I discovered is that, uh, you know, when I started out, I figured, oh, I'm going to build this one fantastic workflow and I'll just press start and three months later I'll have, you know, all the results. Uh, but of course, there you discover that you made some error somewhere. You have to rerun it again and rerun it again. So make every step small enough so that when you screw up, two days later you can do it again. So those were sort of the conclusions that I drew from just doing this. So in summary, I gave you a little bit of background about the evolution of primates and the kind of adaptations they've gone through. Uh, I briefly discussed ortholog findings, so identifying homology across these genomes. Uh, I discussed two forms of alignment, so one of multiple amino acid sequences with each other, uh, so using muscle, and then aligning the cDNAs to these proteins, one by sort of pairwise, using genewise. Um, I discussed tree-based DNDS ratio tests using HiFi. I talked briefly about gene ontology terms and uh, term enrichment, so I'm going to take this much further you know, down the line. Um, and I uh, gave you some overview of the challenges that I've had to deal with as a biologist. And uh, I guess this is where I stop. I'll, I'm very grateful to DBCLS for their kind invitation. Of course, I have to thank my funders. And in the lab in Reading, I've had a lot of help from these two guys um, in sort of thinking this through from a biological point of view. And I'm happy to take your questions.